All right, so we have actually two more class nights. So tonight and next week. And the 15th, uh, we won't have class here. I've got a conference I'm at that night. Um, so y'all can come and meet together. You can jump into another class. But this next week will be the official last week of the course. And we're going to spend tonight on the church and next week on the church and a wrap up. So, but just giving you a heads up, we got two more, two nights together. So, and uh, yeah, I'm close to where I planned from the beginning, which was having nobody show up, but you know, so I'm really close. That's good. I'm making progress every week. <laughs> Yeah, I'm doing a paper at that conference. Yeah, uh, so, what's that? It's on Tertullian and his uh, his defense of the true humanity in the incarnation and the resurrection. So I'm kind of connecting two things he wrote. Yeah, and how he made his case against the heretics and against pagans. So, yeah, that's what it's about. Yeah, so, uh, and I, I have to finish it. It's not done yet. <laughs> so, I got a little work to do on it yet. Uh, but it's on the last day of the conference, the last slot. And so there's a series of different things. They, they have a series of, 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 you know, breakouts going on all over. So, so since it's on the last day, the last slot, probably the audience will be pretty small. Because people will have left town by then. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway. But it's tough because so. presenters stand up and just read their paper. Well, I know some of the best sermons in the world were done that way. Spurgeon read your paper. Yeah, this is different. It's not a sermon. Oh, it's yeah. different. So it's an, it's an academic paper. So it's it's got a very small audience. <laughs> Hey, Jim. Hey. Perfect timing. Yeah. We are just getting started. All right. So I, I mentioned Jim. So we've got tonight and next week, and that'll be our last week for the class. Um, so now tonight's on the church. Um, and I've tried, to, I've tried to lay this out in a way that follows the Trinitarian pattern we followed through with the essential truths. But uh, so tonight it's entrusted to be a faithful healthy, maturing church, because that's what stewardship does in this day. And we'll, un we'll unpack that a bit tonight and work on it some more next week. So big question, what is the church? How would you define it? Ecclesia, so you studied your Greek. Good job. No, I did not study Greek. I just happened to know a few words. <laughs> Well, I'm going to give a few, a few, uh, few concepts that are, I think, biblical to take us through this. And um, so, what the church is biblically defines or determines what the church does. We'll see the unfolding of it in Scripture, especially in. We'll look tonight, at, uh, particularly at the Book of Acts, and we'll, um, as we're doing that, we'll get. A, introduction to what are the marks of the church? Why has the church been established by Christ? Um, and a definition of the church, and this feeds into, I talked about theological method at the beginning of, the, of this class, um, but definition must be biblical, must be Christ-centered, because it is the Son's church representing the Son as we're conforming more like the Son Right and historically authentic, which means the the, the um, what the church represents biblically, what it was established for, that should not change. The foundation of the church should not change, even though how the church practices certain things can change. But, <laughs> but we're going to get into the marks of the church. And we'll look at the marks. Um, 
of the, uh, of the church. And those things should be the same no matter what time in history the church is in. Uh, and so a general definition of the church is standard for particular churches. And we're going to see that in Scripture. As churches were being planted, they were being planted even though in different locations, uh, different uh, differences in the culture of different cities and places were being planted, still it was being given the same um, charge, the same instruction. And we'll see that in a couple of different ways as we walk through Acts, and then we'll dig into it more as we look at the epistles next week. So the true body of Christ is the one holy, Catholic and apostolic church called by God the Father, united in Christ, and preserved by the Spirit. That's one definition of it. Um, and was the word church at all in the Old Testament, or was it in, I don't remember it in the Old Testament. Stand by. Okay. Yeah, we're going to look at language in the Old Testament. Okay. Even though the church, as it is today, is established in the New Testament. Right? We're going to look at, look at language in the Old Testament that describes something similar, even though the church is different. So, but a good, great question. So here's the Creed of Constantinople. At the very end of this creed, so we looked at the Holy Spirit. We looked at Nice Nice said, and the Holy Spirit, and then Constantinople defined it better or gave a better instruction of it because there was heresy about the Holy Spirit, false teaching. But they did this at the end. They, they gave this statement. We believe in the one holy, Catholic, universal, and apostolic church. And then they added on, we acknowledge that one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. That hope statement. Do they believe that you have to be baptized to be saved? Um, that's not exactly what that means. It's not water baptism, but that's the statement oh, about... Spirit mm -hmm. oh, there we right. Um, but the normative thing to do once you came to faith was baptized. Yeah. That was a normative practice. Um, and over time, they began to debate what that meant. They worked through... There were differences on understanding what baptism meant. We're not going to go there tonight. Okay. So... Um, no, just struggle. Yeah, no, no, that's good. That's good. Good question. So um, this one holy Catholic and apostolic, that statement was not something that they just came up with on the fly as they're working through that, that creed and confession. This is what they over time recognized that this is what the church is. Um, and not only looking biblically at that, but also just as they were working through um, the church as it's now finding itself in a culture that has both um, both rejection of the gospel, pagan beliefs, but also inside the church there were disagreements and difficulties, and some were false teachings. So here's Constantinople. You've been through um, post-apostolic. You've been to now, uh, you're in your fourth century, and so the, the church is saying, this is what we are. These are four marks of, of the church, what it represents, biblically. And now, through the work they had to do to, um, to address things in the church, address structure, address um, the uh, carrying on the apostolic teachings, that regular fide, um, being grounded in the scripture, um, coming to where, oh, every church has to confess this. Every church should practice this, the, the baptism in the Lord's Supper. Um, so they, they crafted this statement creedally so that this is something the church would confess. One, holy Catholic. So you had God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit, and now what the church is. So I'm going to walk through this one real quick. And so yesterday, do you know what yesterday was? Oh, hallelujah. Yeah, for 
Reformation yeah. Day. Reformation Day. Oh, was it really? We yes. Celebrate Halloween in our house. We celebrate Reformation Day. Yeah, October. Oh, I wish I had put the picture on here. Um, October 31st is the day that Luther. So that's, that's called Reformation Day. <laughs> now, what he did wasn't the Reformation, obviously, but. But it's tagged. That day is tagged as Reformation Day, so. Um, so what I did for this one Holy Catholic Apostolic, I went a little bit ahead in time, not back in the fourth century, but these are from Calvin's Institutes. Calvin wrote. Um, if you look at Book Four in the Institutes, and you look at most of the most of of that Book Four, he begins at the beginning, kind of unpacking these things about the Church. What is the church? And he's doing it biblically, he's doing it historically, and he's doing it to address what he saw as not that in the Roman church. So he's also addressing that as well. So it's his theology of the church from scripture, from church history, tracing back and addressing what was going on in his day. It's as if, um, it's as if say, that the, uh, um, the pastoral staff at First Baptist Bernie saw something that was wrong, and they sat down today and said, you know what? We believe this because it's in Scripture. Uh, we believe this because that's historically true. That's what the church has always believed. But there's something going on that we need to address. And let's go back to the starting point, Scripture. And let's show how this is faithful to the Scriptures. It's been faithful throughout church history, except for this. So uh, one, here's what Calvin said, and this is just one little excerpt from a long discussion he did on what one means. They are made truly one. This is believers. Since they live together in one faith, hope, and love in the same Spirit of God. So the church is one. He also reflects on Christ's prayer in John 17. May they be one, even as, Father, you and I are one. May they be one. Holy. Um, and he talks about that, and he recognized the imperfections in the church, the imperfection of people, and he said, the Lord is daily at work in smoothing out wrinkles and cleansing spots. Uh, because he's, uh, he's striving, I mean, by the Spirit, striving to make us holy, not only as individuals, but as the church. Not only just the local church, but the church. The church is holy then in the sense that it's daily advancing and not yet perfect. So he recognizes that truth about the people of God, believers in Christ. Catholic, the church is not, not, it's not only the visible church, but also to all God's elect. And he talks about that's true throughout history, all believers throughout history. He talks about the distinction between the visible and the invisible um, because he realizes there's tares among the wheat. And he says this, so this echoes what Irenaeus said very early. The church speaks with one voice. He said, there cannot be two or three churches unless Christ be torn asunder. Because there's one Lord, one church. So even though in different locations, uh, there are individual churches, but there's one church. Uh, because it cannot happen that, that, um, that there are multiple churches different than what Christ established different than what the Holy Spirit stewards. There's one church. That's a huge statement, especially in our culture today. Um, for Calvin, he is, he's reacting to, as Luther and Zwingli and the Anabaptists were, he's reacting to um, what he sees is wrong in the Roman church. And he sees in Geneva, because there's other churches and pastors that are over those churches that are in his area. And he's saying 
Yes, but we are one church. So the church with the pastor over here in that neighborhood, the church pastor over here in that town nearby, we're still one church. Reflecting what the church was, at least early on, had practiced. And even the Roman church was saying that about themselves. There's a, there's a pope over every, over every, every church. I can see you have a question or comment. How do you reconcile when, like those one worships, where you see five churches in a community come together on a football game and they're, hey, we're all we're all believers and let's all you know, go. To, it doesn't matter what church, you just go to church. We used to see that a lot where we came from. Um, how do you, around the grass? But how do you reconcile that? Because we are to be one church. And I might not have complete beliefs of things with one of my neighboring churches. But yeah. Well, well, what what uh, what Calvin identified, and we've we've said this statement before. He identified the marks of the true church. He said if the church is doing this, that's a true church. And he would say any church is doing that. Go back to the there's not there's not you know the the many. Any church that's doing that, that's the true church. Christ is not torn asunder. That's, that's, that's the true church. Any church that's not doing that, that can't be the true church if they're not proclaiming the gospel. Um, and so, and we're gonna, we're gonna dig into this. When we get into the marks of the church, so we'll, I'll introduce that tonight, and we'll spend time on it next week, kind of unpacking those. Um, Yep. Apostolic. This is the difference between the apostles and their successors. So he, he's saying, okay, the, the apostolic era ended, there were apostles, and then that was handed down. And he says, the former, that's the apostles, were sure and genuine scribes of the Holy Spirit. Hey, Lisa. No worries. Um, so apostolic. The difference is the former were sure and genuine scribes of the Holy Spirit. That's what they were given to do. So they're writing scripture and they're teaching the truth of God's word. Um, and they're establishing that in the churches that are being planted. The sole office of others is to teach what is provided and sealed in the Holy Scriptures. So he's reflecting on the thought that was in the early church. Remember the regular fide? We're trying to make sure we're, we're faithful to the, to the apostolic teaching and the scriptures. He's refining that a bit and saying, at the end of the day, faithful to the scriptures. So the prophets wrote, apostles wrote, the Holy Spirit was the, was the one who, through them, gave us the scriptures, so we're faithful to the scriptures. That's what it means to be apostolic. Because the apostles wrote um, when Christ came and was incarnate and after he left, and they're writing everything tied to the gospel, but they're also tying back to the Old Testament. So, um, so here's Calvin, that's 1559, that's what, almost 500 years ago? Um, when he wrote these words, kind of defining them. But we're gonna go back and, and trace it some more, a bit and a bit. But what the church is not. So let's look at some knots. Um, and this is helpful. We won't put all the boundaries around it, but just a few things that it's good to pay attention to. Church is not a building or physical structure. Yes, we have a church building, or buildings on this campus, but that's not the church. That's just where the church meets. Church is not a mark of ethnic or national identity. Um, so, um, church is not equal America. Church is not equal, you know, one particular ethnic group. Um, because how do we know that? 
How can we say that? What did Christ say when he was praying for us, John 17, about that? They are no longer of this world, but I'm sending them back in the world. And then he prayed for us to the Father for, for uh, how we are to be able to, to do the things that Christ sent us or kept us, sent us to be able to do. So um, do we look at ourselves first as belonging to a country or a city or a people group? Or do we look at ourselves as belonging to Christ and strangers and aliens in this world? We belong to him. So the church is not that. Church is not an arm of the state or government. It's not here to support uh, or function as to what the government wants us to, to do. Um, that's temporary. Glad to be here. Glad that, you know, that I was born in this country. But still, I have to remember, no, no, I'm of Christ. And the church is not of the country that we live in, the churches of Christ. Not merely a human organization, a political party, a social club, or a business. And sometimes it's easy, especially in our culture, for the church to, to think in those terms as it's conducting itself. Um, but not that, not a single denomination. So we'll talk a little bit next week about um, the different structures. Not, we won't spend a lot of time on it, but talk about the different, um, different uh, uh, ecclesiastical structures in, in churches. But um, although we are First Baptist Church Bernie, which represents a particular view on what we believe, um, we are not Baptist first, we are Christian first. Um, and if something in what we believe um, in the Baptist faith and message that we, um, that we hold to be our statement of faith, right? If something in there doesn't square with scripture, then we don't say, yeah, but we're Baptist, and so that's why we, that's what we believe is Baptist. No, it's Christian. Um, not a supermarket of spiritual groceries. Not a, well, I go here because I like that that's being taught. And then I go over here because, well, that's where my, that's where my you know, closest friends are, and I want to spend time with them. Well, I go over here because they're offering this, or, or, Hey, First Baptist Church, um, just give me the array of things that you offer and I'll pick the ones I want. Um, and, oh, if you don't have that, you need to add that because that's kind of what I want. And a few other people that I know, I want, they want that too. Or, uh, yeah, guess what? I, I'm real happy to come to, uh, to church on Sunday morning, but I'm going to go to my growth group and then I'll go home and I'll listen to that sermon online or that sermon online or I'll go read this book online. I'll go, I'll go get some of my teaching and things there. Um, you have a face with each one of those, don't you? <laughs> What's that? You have a face with each one of those. Some of them, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Over the last 20 years. Yeah. And not just a gathering of a few believers in Jesus' name. Hey, let's get together. Um, not that. We have to look at um, what is, what's the essential foundation on which the church rests? Here's Wilford Williman, um, or William, Will, 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 William Williman, who wrote What's Right with the Church. He said, there's something amiss in the definition of the church as a voluntary association of believers. A voluntary association. I choose and we choose that we're going to establish a church. Um, I will come when I like to. I'll come when I think, you know, this church is doing something for me. Um, 
The church doesn't exist because some religiously, religiously enlightened people have decided to voluntarily associate with one another to advance the study of Jesus. Uh, we just want to come and learn. Uh, we want to come and study. Let's do that. The church begins like faith itself, not with pious individuals, but with God. So when we come to faith in Christ um, and we are baptized, um, we belong to the church, but we are called to a church in a particular location at a particular time. And that's a huge calling. That's not something to take lightly. Because who's behind that? Well, the Lord, right? Whose church is it? Well, it's the Lord's, no matter where it is. Um, and uh, do we have an obligation to worship the Lord alone or among a community of believers? Do we have an obligation for others? For some kind of assembling of yourself together, and some have mm. gone Hebrews 10 25. Yeah. But continue encouraging one another. Mm. Hard to hard hard to be hard to be one holy catholic and apostolic um if you're not a, a gathering of, of believers together hard not to be that so with the church not church is not optional um it's essential for gl global proclamation we're going to talk about the marks of the church and this this is just a little sliver of that Essential for global proclamation, for proclaiming the gospel. Essential for corporate worship, believers together worshiping the Lord, um, glorifying God. Essential for God's sacramental presence. So when, when we participate in, uh, in observing a baptism, when we participate in taking the Lord's Supper, um, that's not simply a, oh, that's just me doing it right now and others happen to be doing it too. And we're doing it as an assembly of believers. That's why Paul writes about that um, in 1 Corinthians 11, describes the, the practice as a community of believers. Essential for sanctification, um, that uh, we are to help one another, and some are given to do it in specific ways, uh, to grow in our likeness of Christ, to grow more in that way. Hundreds of passages on that, lots of one another passages. Let's talk about that. So stewarding confession, and we're gonna walk into the book of Acts for a bit, we'll spend a little time there. So biblical revelation, what does God disclose in scripture? How's that rightly interpreted? We've, we've seen that before. Faithful and careful expression, how's truth being guarded and taught? I gave you a little glimpse into Calvin's work on that. He's deeply thinking and writing about uh, what the church is. Um, practical implications, why is this truth important? How do we apply it? We'll get through um, part of the first piece tonight, and then I'll point you to some of the things that are marks of the church. Calvin's, by the way, were just three things. Marks of the church is the, is the, uh, the word uh, the word uh, true, truly preached and heard, a rightful administration of the sacraments, um, and uh, uh, the, uh, um, uh, oh my gosh, I just blanked on number three. Um, oh well, it'll come to me. Gosh, I was just looking at that. Anyway. We'll hit it though. Yeah, I know. So, grand narrative, Revelation Church, and we're, I'm going to I'm going to walk you through five areas, but I'm, we'll we'll just look at it. We'll look at one primarily. We will look at the Hebrew language in the Old Testament. Think about that. So, the language of gathering in the Old Testament. There's language of gathering. 
that's not, not different from what God, God called the people of Israel to be. Um, radically different when believers now have the Holy Spirit. That's a radical difference between gathering in the Old Testament and what happened on the day of Pentecost um, that we read about in Acts of the Apostles. Language and narrative indicating nature of the church throughout Acts. And so we're going to look at passages and kind of think about that together. We'll walk through a lot of passages in, in Acts because that's where the church is being planted and, and in different places. Uh, declaration, the marks of the true church in, in and throughout the New Testament. So we'll, we'll touch on a few, then I'll give you a list, and we'll unpack that in the, in the epistles uh, meet together next week. What are the marks of the true church? And there's more than the three that Calvin has, but you could probably summarize those in what he says. Uh, signpost reminders of the Son as Lord of the church and the Spirit as a steward of the church. There's, there's reminders about that throughout the, throughout the uh, book of Acts, even in the Gospels. I mean, that John 17 prayer, he is praying for the church. John 13 through 16, he's instructing the apostles on what it's going to look like when he's gone, what the church will look like in some aspects. And then the development and practice of the church after the apostles, which continue to the present. So lots of things that happened in the context of what was going on in their time that help them to better think about what is the church truly and how do we practice this rightly. And we still should be thinking about that today. All right, so Old Testament language. There's a couple of words, a couple of Hebrew terms. Um, one is the, the a term kohal, and that's the act of assembling. So it's translated, so the LLX, that's the Greek translation of the Old Testament. And the Greek Old Testament, when they see that word kohal, it's it's translated ecclesia, ecclesia, or synagogue. So the assembling. Um, Hebrew yada, and that's the assembly of people. So another term that's used, and you see that, and that gets translated in LXX as synagogue. So you see where that word synagogue comes from uh, that you have in the New Testament. It's a Greek term, but it reflected the, uh, the assembly of God's people uh, to worship him, to receive instruction, um, those things. So let's just look at a couple passages with, with those terms in them. Uh, here's Kahal, Exodus 19, that term, or I'm sorry, Deuteronomy 9.10, and referring back to Exodus 19 when, uh, when God is on Mount, Mount Sinai and the commandments are going to be given but the people are there before that begins. And this is the, this is the law being given back to the second generation that's gonna go into the, into the promised land. So they're getting the, they're getting the re-instruction. Um, so Moses is reminding these, this next generation about what happened with their parents. The Lord gave me the two tablets of stone written by the finger of God and on them were all the words that the Lord had spoken with you at the mountain from the midst of the fire on the day of the assembly. You were there at the mountain at the beginning. Um, you were assembled together and then, you know, sent off because you were too fearful to be on close to the mountain. And only Moses goes up and sits in the presence of the Lord. But that assembly, that's Kohal. That's assembly or congregation, the gathering of all the people of Israel. First Kings 12, this is post-Solomon. Uh, then they sent word and summoned him and Jeroboam and all the assembly of Israel. So there's a kahal. All the assembly of Israel came and spoke to Rehoboam. So this is when the church, is, I mean the church, this is when Israel is splitting. Uh, Rehoboam wants to take, he's declared he's going to take over. Jeroboam is challenging that. They're all coming and speaking to Rehoboam about how, if he's going to be the leader, how he should conduct himself. But it's all the assembly. There's a call. Exodus 12, 3. This is the initiation of the Passover. And uh, the Lord tells Moses, speak to all the congregation 
that yada, all of Israel, saying on the 10th of this month, they are each one to take a lamb for themselves according to the father's household. So the entire assembly of the people, the entire people of Israel are being told how they are going to remember what God did to deliver them through the practice of the Passover. Here's how you're going to do it tonight, and then here's how you're going to practice it. So you've got that sense in the Old Testament of the gathering of God's people. Of course, then you have the, the different practices of that gathering. You have the, um, the Festival of Booths. You have the Day of Atonement. Uh, so you have those different times when people are, are gathered together, the formal times and the informal times. Here's the New Testament. The word in the New Testament is ecclesia, so, or ecclesia. Um, and in the Greek, that could mean just a social or political assembly, the general word in the Greek language, the general word in that culture. Ecclesia could mean that, generally. But it's used in the New Testament, and especially by Paul in his writings, he employ, employs that Greek term, that term which meant some kind of an assembly, to refer to distinct community or communities of Christians. So Paul takes that word and applies that to describe Christians meeting together, gathering together, being established together. Um, and so here's four meanings of ecclesia in the New Testament language. It could be the general assembly of believers. It could be a local Christian congregation. So we see in Revelation 2 and 3, those letters to the churches, that a letter is being written to each individual church specific to what they need to hear. Um, a regional Christian community. So it could be just generally a, a community of believers in an area or region. When he says write to the church in Sardis, it's literally saying write to the Ecclesia in Sardis. Is that what it said? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Exactly. And then the whole church. So when Paul writes something, it's addressed to the whole church, encompassing the whole church. Even if it's in a particular letter to a, to a congregation, he's describing something that's true for the whole church, ecclesia. Um, so those four general definitions. Um, and uh, the ecclesia used for a local Christian congregation is the common use. That's the most usage of it in the New Testament, speaking to a particular congregation, Book of Acts and this as well. Uh, and where do we get the word church from? Well, that's actually an English term. Um, and kirche from kyriakos, meaning of the Lord. So they adopted that kiri church akos of the Lord. Um, so that English translation. Okay, let's, look at, let's walk through a bit of Acts. So Acts 5.11. And great fear came over the whole church and over all who heard these things. Well, what was the context of that? That's where Ananias and Sapphira have lied to the Holy Spirit and they're individually called to account. And when, when this term is used in Acts, ecclesia, the whole ecclesia, that meant everybody in the church in Jerusalem. I mean, everyone, fear came over them. Acts 8, jump a little bit. On that, on that day, a great persecution began against the church in Jerusalem. So this is right after, right after Stephen was martyred. So now that initiates persecution to the church. So Stephen proclaiming the gospel in a very fierce um, and direct way gets stoned. Saul's, Saul's watching as this is going on, standing by his clothing. And then a persecution begins to, against a church in Jerusalem so that they were all scattered throughout the region of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. So they, they're going to flock out. Well, guess what? That's also going to spread the church into churches. That process will begin. God has a tendency to do that. Remember the Tower of Babel? They all spoke in one language. They were all piled up in one place. 
But at the very beginning, he told them to do what? Take over the whole earth. Spread out. Become more numerous. You know, multiply. And they didn't want to. So he said, he, he confused their language. So they had to scatter. Yeah. And so then again, he tells them, and I want you to go to Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and the other most parts of the world. So they all congregated in groups. Oh man, this is pretty good. We're all together here. We're not good. Time. Yeah. Well, you know, it, it's me, you know? yeah. It's not. Nece- said, it's not necessarily. It's not necessarily they're being disobedient. No, that's not. No, that's no, not. That's right. not true. Yes, no. no, they're, they're, they're not they're, deliberately being disobedient. They don't yet fully understand. Yeah. Because the promise has been made, and this is a catalyst to to help begin that process, this persecution. But uh, because they're not resistant to doing it. I mean, they have to learn it, just like Paul had to learn, oh, it can go to the Gentiles. Okay. So it's not, it's not resistance to the command of Christ, the prophecy and the promise and the uh, instruction. Um, and they don't, but we also know they don't get accused of being disobedient. So it's not. <laughs> anyway, Saul began ravaging the church entering house after house, dragging off men and women, he would put them in prison. So, describing Paul's work to go from this place to that place to that place, not like there's all of them assembled together. Acts 9, so this is the next chapter, and guess what happens? So the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria enjoyed peace uh, being built up. So they're being faithful, they're growing, and they're going on in the fear of the Lord and the comfort of the Holy Spirit as it continued to increase. This is just after Saul's converted. So Saul's converted in Acts chapter 9, and then the church experiences uh, this peace. But notice, in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, is the Holy Spirit present and active throughout all that's happening in the church? Absolutely. And this is just one of those little signposts of that. Acts 11, 22, 26, the news about them reached the ears of the church at Jerusalem. Um, and they sent Barnabas off to Antioch. So he's, they're going to go get who? Saul. And bring him to Antioch. When he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. And for an entire year, they met with the church. So here's Paul now. He's, he's on staff at the church in Antioch. <laughs> and taught considerable numbers. And the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. First called Christians. First time that name. So you go to late fourth century, and here's um, uh, Chrysostom, who's Bishop of Antioch. Well, he's not Bishop yet. He's a presbyter under the Bishop. Um, And there's a big riot in Antioch about something that the the, uh, emperor did. And Chrysostom, while so the bishop has to go and run off and try and protect the city from an invasion from the emperor based on what they've done. And Chrysostom has to preach. And it's time of Lent. It's a time where they're preparing for Easter. And so his first sermon is about this. And he rem- because some church members were involved in that riot. And he reminds them, this is where we were, we were first called Christians. We own that legacy. He's reminding them of, of how significant it is that, that uh, they've got that history and they betrayed it by being involved in this riot. Anyway, just a little side story. Um, so there's Paul at Antioch, meeting with the church in Antioch, being in the church in Antioch, teaching, seeing the church grow. Um, and then Acts 12. Uh, so bad things are going to happen again. Here's Herod, and he laid hands on some who belonged to the church. So he's persecuting the church. He's uh, starting a fresh persecution. Peter gets in prison. Peter kept in prison, but prayer for him is being made fervently by the church to God. Ah, so that's an interesting mark of the church, um, because the church is the church is praying for him. Um, doesn't go into detail about what they're praying, but they're praying for, uh, for him. Acts 13, 
Uh, here's where Paul's going to get sent, and Barnabas. Now they were at Antioch in the church that was there, prophets and teachers. Barnabas and Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manian, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, so someone from Herod's uh, household, uh, and Saul. And so Paul and Barnabas, are, they're praying and fasting, and the Holy Spirit says, set aside Paul and Barnabas, send them out um, from the church in Antioch, and they're going to go and do what? They're going to take the gospel from synagogue to synagogue in different places and proclaim the gospel. And then churches will get formed. Lots of them are Gentiles. Here's Acts 14. Uh, when they had appointed elders for them in every church, having prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord in whom they had believed. So we see a, another signpost here. Here's church order being established. Here overseers, presbyteros being established in churches, and they're doing it in every church. Every church is getting um, someone who will, or someones who will lead that church. Um, and so that's happening. Acts 14:27 when they had arrived and gathered the church together, so they're back in Antioch, they've come back. They began to report all the things God had done with them and how he had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles. This is Paul reporting back to the church at Antioch who had sent him, but he's also established churches. But he's coming back to describe what happened. Um, and next step is gonna be, he's gonna get affirmation for what has happened with the churches that he's planted he and Barnabas. So here's Acts 15, and that process happens. Therefore, being sent on their way by the church, so he's sent from Antioch, passing through both Phoenicia and Samaria. Oh, Samaria, that's one of the places where, oh, yeah, into the, describing detail of the conversion of the Gentiles. So it's in line with what Peter saw, and they've been preaching the, to, directly to the Gentiles. Gentiles are being brought to faith, but oh, there's some who are saying, no, no, they must be taught to obey the law. They've got to get circumcised. All these things have to happen. So that's, so that's why they're sent to Jerusalem. When they arrived in Jerusalem, they were received by the church and the apostles and the elders. So notice elders. You've got that structure that's happened in Jerusalem. And they reported all that God had done to them. So you've got two churches, Antioch, Jerusalem. Uh, and Jerusalem's a, that's a center point for the church. Uh, and so they give the report, and the church, uh, through the Holy Spirit, says, no, the, gen the Gentiles do not have to do this, but simply these two things. Uh, avoid eating meat sacrificed idols and sexual immorality. Yeah. Question. Yeah. I know we have a lot of deacons here, and we have a number of boards. Do we have an elder? Do we have specifically elders? We do not. Yeah. We do not. Um, we have a pastoral staff, yeah. Um, but this church, in throughout its history, has determined not to establish, and uh, not to establish elders in that name. So um, there's still an organization and a structure and leadership, and yeah, that yeah. That's a great question. What was that? It's the distinction between elders and a pastoral staff. Yeah, that's um, a great question. I'm not sure there would be too much distinction between elders and like a deacon body with the rest of the pastoral staff. I don't think, I don't think they pretty much serve the same function. Oh, you're saying pastors and deacons do? Yeah. Interesting. Um, well, in the, in the Presbyterian Church, if I'm not mistaken, the ideas of elders is that they basically run everything. They interpret what the, the scriptures for you. So, mm, interesting. Yeah. So. Yeah. I know in the letter to Titus, there's a distinction between deacon and elder. There, there is. Yeah. And and Timothy as well. Paul's letter to Timothy. There is so, a distinction. But that's because we have. We no longer accept the term deacon exactly the way it was intended in the early church, I don't think. 
Hmm, interesting. Do you think that the deacon board, since you're saying we, meaning for Baptists, yeah. do you think uh, that... No, I'm referring to we as in Baptists in general. Okay. Okay, because so specifically here... Yeah. Yeah. to be able to preach? A deacon? Yeah. Only, only if the Holy Spirit is giving that. Well, let me let me say this before we go too far down this down this trail. Everybody going to be here next week? You think? Okay. So when I get into marks of the church, we're going to talk about this specifically, and I'll unpack that for you, and then you can ask that question again. So, and Matt brings up a very good point. Um, so, yeah, is there a distinction? Um, and uh, I have to tread carefully. <laughs> but we'll uh, well, we'll we'll get into it. Think of it big term versus what's here at this location, because a deacon at this location is different than the deacon that we had in Dallas. It's probably a whole lot different than the deacon I had back in Bayou Jack. Yeah. So, okay. So yeah. Re remember that question. I'm gonna. Uh, it's gonna be here anyway. But remember that question, so that I make sure that. I've addressed it um, to your question and to your comment and to your comments. And, and, well, so I'm so hung up on the word church because they certainly had, there was the temple and there were synagogues, which local Jewish people went to yeah. and had their assembly. Yeah. So why did it not just become Synagogue. Why are we not a Christian synagogue? Oh, well, um, yeah, remember that, um, well, yeah, yeah. Because um, the Old Testament was the assembly, which became right. synagogues. Yeah. But, but just a quick clarification, the same way that, that we make the distinction between the church as a, as a gathering of people as opposed to a church building, yeah. synagogue, yeah. sin, and, and, and agage, okay. is, sin is, is with, and agage is just a, assembly. People. Right. So it's, okay. it's, it's an assembly of people with each other in and out. Yeah. Because they didn't necessarily, they didn't have the spirit, so it was a coming to a building to perform. No, 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 no. So it's not the building is not the synagogue. The gathering of the people, the people is the right. synagogue. So, so the way we make that distinction between the church building versus the people, right? the Jews make the exact same distinction. So, that, so why did we not become Christian synagogues? I mean, I mean there, well, there's a, there's a, yeah. Yeah, but there, so there's, but there are a few reasons why. Okay. Notice that we see here we're seeing Luke use that term. Then we're going to see Paul use that term. The church. Huh? Okay. Then we're going to see John use that term. Um, so, uh, so it's it does define something distinct about okay, about so Christians. Yeah, that's why the the uh, um, the uh, English term church comes from that of the Lord, okay. right? Um, but that would be anachronistic to go back and say, well, that's why we use ecclesia because that's not. Um, but um, you've got a distinct people because they've been. What, what's what's the big one big difference between the church and uh, the the assembly of people in the synagogue and the assembly of people in the church. The Holy Spirit. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, regenerate, presence of the Holy Spirit. Of the Lord. Right? And not just one leader who proclaims, or, or a set of leaders that proclaim, but every believer has the Holy Spirit. That wasn't true in the Old Testament. Right. Wasn't true in the, when, when the, uh, the synagogue continues into the New Testament, Jewish believers, but now you have every single believer. Right. So, it's interesting that the word cut on and that we weren't, it, we weren't yeah. called the building of the way. So it's interesting. Yeah. Just what they used in marketing. Yeah. Well, the term of Christ's life was supposedly derogatory in the God. But it didn't take the Christians very long there to realize that's a pretty good way to describe this. Yeah. Now, we're not just followers of the way being some part of Judaism. No. We're Christ-like. 
And um, who's the author of the scriptures? So there's something there as well in the choice of term. <laughs> um, okay, uh, we just got a few more minutes, but I got to get through some more of this. These are these are great questions. This is really good. Uh, but we'll finish out Acts real quick. So here's Paul, um, and he's. He's, he's back on the road, traveling through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. So the churches were being strengthened in the faith and were increasing in number daily. So there's a continued consistency in individual churches. Not the growing, per se, but the strengthening. Because Paul is doing the same things in each church that he's visiting to. He's trying to give them instruction in the faith, which is what he describes to Timothy in his letter to Timothy. Uh, and so... Uh, even though different context for the churches, because each letter is different in how Paul needs to address that particular church with what's going on, but still his goal is growing them into maturity in Christ, establishing these overseers, these elders, these presbyteros, who will be able to faithfully teach the word to the believers, who understand what's, how, how the church should, should grow and should honor the Lord, who should practice the the baptism of the Lord's Supper, uh, as Christ established it. So if they were translating the scriptures from Greek or Latin into English, they would just put the term church in there. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, when he landed at Caesarea, this is Paul, he went up and greeted the church and went down to Antioch. From Miletus, he was said to Ephesus, call to them the elders of the church. This is when, uh, when Paul's on his way to go to Jerusalem, on his way to, be, to, to go on trial, experience whatever's going to happen there that he doesn't yet know. Um, but he calls the elders of the church, be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock, which among the Holy Spirit made you overseers. So yes, Paul's appointing them in the churches but the Holy Spirit is the one he acknowledges who's appointing them and who's giving them this charge. And it's the Holy Spirit who's going to, uh, because he doesn't think he's going to be with them again when he says this to them. But uh, you have responsibility, but the Holy Spirit's the one who is, has established you in this, in, in this um, office, in this responsibility, as this leader, um, to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. Now, the term overseer there, is that what we call today a bishop, pastor, or a deacon? Well, the terms are, there's two terms, and they're, they're kind of, there's overseers and presbyteros, episcopos and presbyteros. Um, so, and, yeah, there's not, in this time, there's not a distinction between those in the churches. So, we'll talk a little about that next week. Um, here's Kevin Giles. Uh, the point scene... Need, simply needs to be made that in modern English, the best word to give the meaning of ecclesia in Christolog Christian theological usage is community. Sometimes the word alludes to the whole Christian community, all believers, everywhere. Sometimes the Christian community in a particular location. Sometimes the community people meet together. The reason I ask you that question is because he refers to the elders as overseers. The way we interpret overseers could be mean that the elders are the same as whatever. Yeah, there's 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 a there's an episcop a, a ecclesiological episcopy that develops over time that we'll briefly touch on, and I tell you, every one of them claims no. This is this is in scripture, so that's a fascinating uh, thing to to study about. The true body of Christ is one holy Catholic Church, called by God the Father, united in Christ, preserved by the Spirit. And a true con con Christian congregation today, so this is not a whole lot different from what Calvin would say back in the 1600 or the 16th century, 1500s. Not different from what uh, from what Constantinople was saying. Not different than what Irenaeus was saying, uh, second century. True Christian congregation today is centered on Christ's person and work. Thank you. Why do we keep saying Catholic? It means universal. Yeah, that was the that was. That was before it became the Roman Church and the Roman Catholic Church. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. That's why. Yeah. Yeah. So, so for example, John Calvin, who I mentioned in a walkthrough, so he uh, he confesses uh, what was said early, but he redefines this word because he doesn't want association with the church at Rome. So he's carefully explaining it, you know, what the church is. Um, yeah. No. No, no, no. Was not. I wasn't sure if you were saying that he changed it to He doesn't change it. He doesn't change it. He just he explains what it truly means. And and he speaks of the Roman Church, not the Roman Catholic Church. Um or the Roman um anyway. Uh so but great question. Uh and if you're uncomfortable with it, there's another way to say it, but the meaning that was had in Constantinople remains the same. And again, they were, they were um, learning that meaning with greater import during those days when there was a serious need to uh, have the churches in the midst of heretical teachings that happened, like Paul warned, the people at Ephesus that were happening inside the church and out and outside the church, um, so that was a term where uh, they would do things to make sure that or try to ensure that all the church was preaching the word rightly. Not like today. Huh? Not like today. <laughs> Today's interesting. <laughs> Today's interesting. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit next week too. I could, I've got a, a kind of a question about that. Okay. Really quick, marks of the true church. I'm just gonna run through a list of these and then we'll unpack them next week, right? Or not, if not all. Marks of the church, oriented towards the glory of God, bringing him glory when gathered and when not. So our focus when we, when we gather together shouldn't be on ourselves, it should be to bring glory to God. Um, and you think about that when the words preach, you think about that with when, uh, when the word is proclaimed in, in, in song, you think about that when, when the word is proclaimed in prayer. Focus on the word of God, Christ and the scriptures. Right? Christ, the word of God, the son of God, and the scriptures. Created, gathered, gifted, and empowered by the Holy Spirit. Don't forget the Holy Spirit is actively at work in the son's church everywhere it is. Um, gathered as members in a covenant relationship with God and a committed relationship to one another. So when you start thinking about that, then being a casual attender at a church doesn't make sense. You've got a covenant relationship with God and what he's established and a committed relationship to one another. Um, we say those words here. Unif uni united by a personal confession of faith in Christ, and a common confession of biblical and historic Christian faith. So that has always been intended to be true as we, as we try and steward faithfully what's been handed down to us. Yes, I mean, the personal confession, because someone coming to faith in Christ, it's unique to what, uh, what the Holy Spirit did in them to convict them of the truth of the gospel. But also we have this common confession that, that we uh, that we should hold to. Um, and that's why I, I tried to emphasize the essential truths because that's the common confession, right? The heart of that. Called to proclaim the gospel and advance the kingdom of God. And assembled as a historical reality, each local church in its place, no matter where that is and when that is, in its place, in its place in time, exercising stewardship of all these marks in the here and now. So um, um, I was privileged to sit in, in the Theology Lunch today where, where Matt was teaching about that. He's teaching about the, 
um, the discipline and instruction that fathers are to have to their children, walking through how important it is for us to be able to establish the truth about God, Father, Son, and Spirit, the truth about His church, the truth about the confession of our faith, and that becomes the, he uses the term blueprint. Um, uh, the, so the padea, I say that word right? Yeah. The padea by which um, we instruct the next generation so that when they encounter anything going on outside the church or in the church, um, they're learning how to respond with the truth of God's word. Um, so it's one of the reasons why I want to do this class so we could think more about that. All right? Okay, next week we'll, we'll work more through this. Jim will hit on your question, right? Because we're going to talk about orthodoxy, order, which is the those who have been established to oversee the church um, and how that works, and then ordinances, the practice of those things. So those are three marks of the true church. Just saying, we put um, a lot of emphasis on being historically accurate to the way the church has always done it. it says elders, we don't have elders. So I'll, I'll be interested to see what you say. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, tell us why you're wrong. <laughs> I will too. And then, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we'll, we'll talk about it. Yeah. Unless we have elders by some other name. <laughs> because, I mean, even the Apostle Paul, says, I mean, I'm not, but in Acts, I did, I just gave you two different terms. One was overseer and the other was elder. And it meant the same thing. It was the same people that he was talking to. He Trent, said, you, overseer. Yeah. I mean, I have to call them elders. Yeah. So, well, I'll, 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 yeah, I'll quickly walk you through the Greek terms. The episcopos, presbyteros, diakonos, the deacons. They are distinct. They are distinct. They're what? They are distinct in Scripture. Yes. Yeah, they are distinct in Scripture. So we'll talk about that. All right.